The General Grand Council of Cryptic Masons International welcomes you to the following presentation. Welcome to General Grand Council Presents. Tonight, we are going to be enlightened by Brother Matt Parker. His presentation is going to be Ego and the False Self. So without further ado, Matt, please take it away. Well, thank you, uh, Brother Steve, and I appreciate that. Um, and brothers, thank you for everyone coming out tonight. I, I really appreciate that, and I hope what I have to say will resonate with you. Uh, this is a presentation I've, I've been asked many times to share this presentation uh, or provide the, the written presentation to lodges or to brothers. And truth is, I've never written down a word of it. Um, every time I give the presentation, it may vary a little bit here and there. There's nothing scripted, no slides. Um, but it is about ego and the false self. And how that relates to masonry so we all have an ego we'll just start with that that that's built into us god gave us an ego for a reason it serves a purpose but too often we allow the ego to take control and how do we do that that's the false self you see we go through life day to day wearing masks uh, the masks are not really who we are it's the role that we are playing at any given time so uh when i'm in my office doing my job i've got that face on when i'm around my brothers in lodge i've got that face on when i'm with my family it's a different face it's always a different face but none of those faces are the true self that is how we are conditioned to behave, how we're expected to act. Uh, and it's a part that we're playing. There are really only two times in our lives when we are actually our true self. The first is when we're asleep, because think about it, you can't lie to yourself in your sleep. And the second time is a time called the hypnagogic phase. The hypnagogic phase is that little window in between being asleep and awake uh, where you're semi-conscious, but you're not really aware of the world around you. You're not functioning with the conscious mind at that point. So it's a little window there. We're all familiar with that. Um, sometimes we have lucid dreaming in that, in that time period. But you can also enter the hypnagogic state through meditation or contemplation. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I can assure you that it's nothing... Uh, strange out there. I'm not telling you to get a yoga mat and sit cross-legged and, and chant OM. That's not what I mean when I, when I talk about meditation. So again, we'll talk about that a little later. But it really all starts with our inner, inner apprentice degree. Um, the inner apprentice degree sets the stage for understanding the ego and how we are supposed to deal with that. Unfortunately, it's just so easily overlooked when we are divested of all minerals and metals before we enter the lodge room what does that mean why do we leave that behind why do we uh in most lodges anyway we leave our street clothes what we walked into the building with in the preparation room and, and put on some old pajamas or uh garments why what does that symbolize well, sure, you, you hear brothers say, oh, that's to symbolize that you're uh, poor and destitute. And, I mean, that, that sounds all nice and flowery, but that's not what it really means. Uh, it's not, that's never what it was intended to mean. You see, the minerals and metals, your watches, rings, uh, earrings, piercings, or, or whatever you have, um, your street clothes, all of that represent your attachment to the material world. And those are the things that tend to control us on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be our 
or jobs, uh, investments, homes, vehicles, families, all of these things in the material world that, that consume us during the day. And a lot of times, you know, it affects us at night. We just can't sleep because we're worrying about these things. And so what's happened? Those things are controlling us. We're not in control of them. And we're all guilty of that. That happens to every one of us. But masonry offers clues as to being able to control that. And that begins with setting aside the minerals and metals. And that inner apprentice degree, when you take that step into the lodge room for the first time, being conducted in, you are taking a step into a sacred space. It is separate and apart from the material world. So the things of the material world, the minerals and metals, have no place in that sacred space. That's also the ego that we're leaving outside. All of our concerns, everything that we think we are, everything that we are concerned about on a daily basis, everything that we uh, have to deal with, that has no place in the lodge room. It needs to be left outside. That's actually why it's one of my pet peeves when I see a brother pull out a cell phone in lodge, start checking texts or social media. Um, again, there's no place for that in the lodge room because the sacred space, that tiled space, is meant to be a retreat from that material world. It's a place where you center yourself and where you can focus on the true self. And we'll, we'll really talk about maybe what the definition of true self is uh, shortly. But we all go through these cycles every day. One mask, then another mask, then another mask. And think about it, during our waking conscious day, we lie to ourselves all day long. We just do, positive and negative. We've all known men or women or people in general who uh, have a sense of entitlement or think they are the best looking person in the room. Um, we can't all be as good looking as Andy Adams. Honestly, let's just face it. But we all know these people that have this overinflated self of uh, sense of self worth, right? It can also work the opposite way. We all know people who talk negatively to themselves. They're always feeding themselves negative input. I'm not good enough. I can't do that. That's not within my grasp. That's also the ego working against us. That's that false self whispering things to us. So the trick is to listen to the true self, get in touch with the true self. So we talked about the inner apprentice degree, being able to divest ourselves of all minerals and metals. We take that first step into the sacred space. But in, in the fellow craft degree, We uh, go through a flight of winding stairs. Uh, unless you're a Pennsylvania Mason, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But the flight of winding stairs consisting of three, five, and seven steps, the outer and inner porch, the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. What is all of that telling us? What is that leading to? I mean, sure, we can tie that to the uh, five orders of architecture, uh, the, uh, or excuse me, the, the pillars, the um, seven liberal arts, and that's all great. That's important stuff. But what's it really symbolizing? It's symbolizing that journey to, to try to find the true self, the inner self. I like to think of that as the divinity within us. It's that spark of God, that spark of creation, divinity that's in each and every one of us. That is the true self. And it will never, never steer you wrong. But it's easier to listen to the false self. It's easier to listen to the masks that we wear every day because we are so convinced 
that that's who we are. So if I were to go through each and every one of you and say, okay, who are you? You could tell me your name, your occupation. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a uh, employer, employee, whatever the case may be. And those are all things that describe an attribute of us. That's not who we are. So I'll submit this to you. When we talk about the lost word, what is the lost word? And we say that's the name of God, the name of deity. But if we take it a step further and realize that deity is within each and every one of us, God resides within us, then it takes on a whole new meaning. The lost word is the true self. And we're all royal arch masons here, so I'll even tie that to the royal arch. As we go deeper and deeper from one arch to the next, we're getting closer and closer and closer until we finally reach that ultimate goal, the discovery of the true self. In the fellow craft degree, we arrive at the altar in the lodge room, uh, and we say that we have arrived at the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple, not the inner chamber, not the sanctum sanctorum, the middle chamber. Have you ever noticed that in our degrees, we never arrive at the inner chamber? Has that ever struck anyone as being strange? I think there's a reason for that. When we are in the middle chamber, symbolically, we are looking towards the east. We are peering into the Holy of Holies. So tying this all to the building of the Temple of Solomon. In the temple, what divided the middle chamber from the inner chamber, the Sanctum Sanctorum? It was just a veil, right? A veil that we believe was, was woven by Hiram of Biff. So as we spend more and more time in that middle chamber, we're peering through that veil and we see glimpses of the true self. And the more time we stand there, the more time we spend there in that contemplative state uh, or that meditative state or in touch with the true self, we see those bits and pieces. And we start to see the bigger picture of who we are. Now, that's a life lifelong journey. And I think that's the reason why in our degrees, we never arrive at the inner chamber, because that is a lifelong journey. We're all master masons. But how many of us have mastered the inner apprentice degree? How many of us have mastered the fellow craft degree? We spend more of our waking lives in the realm of the inner apprentice than we ever do master mason. The master mason is what we aspire to be. But that's not where we spend most of our time. We spend most of our time running up and down the the flight of winding stairs and on the outer porch. Occasionally we'll start, step into the middle chamber and we'll see glimpses of the inner chamber. Eastern philosophy talks about the search for enlightenment. And we think about the uh, guru sitting on the top of a mountain a uh, snow-covered mountain, and then there's a six-foot radius of green grass around it because he's so enlightened, right? And sometimes we think that's where we want to be. We want to get to that point. Well, we're not really going to get to that point until we lay down our working tools, but we can catch glimpses of that. We can piece that together, and we can get in touch with that true self. So the ego is a tool that we all use. Think of the ego as your apprentice. You are the master mason. The ego is your apprentice. So it's okay. It's okay for the ego to be with you. It's okay to use the ego, but the ego cannot be left unsupervised. So taking that analogy of, the ego being your apprentice. 
if you give your working tools to your apprentice and just walk away, just assuming, oh, everything's going to be fine, what's worse can happen? How well do you think your, your project, whether it be a column or an ashler or whatever the case may be, how well do you think it's going to be done? It needs that guidance. You can't let go of the reins. And we all do that. We jump to conclusions. We get angry for the wrong reasons. And all because the ego tells us we're justified in that. Let's look at the, the two columns. What does that represent? We have the, the two columns of Sing, King Solomon's temple. You also have another symbol, the circumpunct, the point within the circle that's bordered by two parallel lines. We really don't really go into detail about what that means. It's just, here they are. Make up your own mind. But I really think they represent extremes. You have one extreme, you have another. And we, whether we like it or not, we're living in a time where the extremes are so stark. And just when we think, we know where one extreme is. Someone mo moves that goalpost, right? And so people now, they will cling to their one extreme. And they don't want to hear anyone else's opinion or thoughts because it may conflict with their beliefs. Right or wrong, it's going to conflict with their beliefs, so they don't want to hear you. And oftentimes, they'll do whatever they can to shut you down so that they don't have to hear your thoughts or your opinions. And brothers, the answer is never at one extreme or the other. It's somewhere in between. And that's where we need to navigate. So we need to uh, think of the pillars or think of the parallel lines as those extremes and not cling to one extreme or the other. Because when we do that, we are excluding a world of other ideas and thoughts. That doesn't mean we have to believe or agree with everything that comes before us. But we're wiser and we're better for at least listening and experiencing that. And then considering that. The ego often tells you, don't consider that that person's wrong. The true self says, you know what? Just listen. Think about it. How does this apply to you? And then determine whether you think that is right or not. I mentioned that we all have working tools that we, that we use. And uh, the analogy I'm about to give you could apply to any of the working tools of masonry. Uh, I mean, heck, it could apply to this paper clip right here. But our most recognized tool in masonry is the gavel, right? So I always keep a gavel near me. I have this one here in my home office. I have another gavel on my desk at my uh, work office. Uh, always have a gavel near me. And the reason why is I was uh, sitting here one day holding this gavel, just kind of meditating on the gavel. You know, what does the gavel really mean? What does it represent? Why do we wield a gavel in lodge? And, uh, you know, I mentioned we get to the hypnagogic state. It's that state where uh, the true self is really coming through. The ego is shut down. Our conscious mind is, is not uh, speaking to us in that moment. We're just in that zone, so to speak. And so I'm staring at this gavel. Then I realized we refer to our tools, working tools in masonry, of being these instruments of creating beauty. At no time do they ever tell you that this same gavel that can help to form the perfect stone, the perfect ashlar, that same gavel could also destroy that perfect ashlar. Could split it right in half. So that's what happens when we, we use our internal working tools. If we hand off our working tools to the ego, that's what's going to happen. It's going to cause chaos, destruction. 
even though that's not your intent. So we have to be careful how we wield our internal gavel because we may have the best of intentions, the best of intentions. But if we are not prudent, if we're not uh, judicious in the way we use our working tools, we will hurt other people. We'll destroy relationships. We can create a lot of damage with our working tools. Same thing could apply to the level, to the square, to the plumb, the compasses. If they're not used right, you are not going to create that perfection and beauty that you were looking for. And we're all trying to build that temple. So we were talking about the Temple of Solomon earlier, the inner chamber, the, the uh, middle chamber, inner chamber, chamber, Sanctum Sanctorum. But the Temple of Solomon is a, also a metaphor. So we say that each lodge represents the Temple of Solomon. We also say that we are the lodge. It represents the internal lodge. So therefore, the Temple of Solomon, we can apply to ourselves. If you're building your temple, do you want uneven stones or rough stones? Do you want your, your workers, your fellow craft, to misuse the square or the plum? What's going to happen? Is that temple going to be stable? It's going to collapse. It's going to be uneven. And we can't allow that to happen because we are, throughout our lifetimes, working on my, our own temple. I think one of the other things in masonry that we tend to overlook is we always talk about the perfect ashlar. Singular, the perfect ashlar. And I think that's wrong. I really do. We should be talking about ashlers, plural. No temple is built out of one stone. It's thousands and thousands of stones. So when we talk about perfecting our perfect ashler, we have a lot of ashlers to work on. So maybe you want to quit smoking. That's one ashler. Maybe you want to lose weight. That's another ashler. Maybe you want to be a better husband. That's one ashler. You want to be a better employee. That's one ashler. You want to be a better fisherman? That's an ashler. Those are all things that we work on. We want to shape those. We want to hewn those stones so they fit perfectly into our temple. The temple is the all-encompassing uh, true self. So if we want to experience the true self, if we want to uh, you know, get to that place, we have to work on a lot of different ashlers. We can't just pick one thing and say, okay, I have finished that one ashler. I'm done. Doesn't work that way. No temple is built with one stone. Just doesn't happen. I talked about the two times where we are our true selves. When we are asleep or in that hypnagogic state. And by the time this presentation's all uh, over with, you're, you're all going to be walking around saying, hypnagogic, you're going to try to work that into a conversation. I just know it. And I hope you do. Why do we go down the road with our radio blaring, the windows down? Why do we do that? Why do we keep the television on in the background? Just background noise. We're not really paying attention. We're in the office, we have the radio on, we're not really paying attention. But why do we do that? Why do we have to have that background sound? You know, when I'm going down I-40 at 80 miles an hour, blasting my radio with the window down, um, you know, I just assume it's because everybody on the road wants to hear Billy Joel as much as I do. But it could it be this? Could it be that we're afraid to be alone 
with our own thoughts. It's scary to be alone, alone with your own thoughts because that's when you have realizations. And, and yes, Danny, we do all love Uptown Girl. You're absolutely right. We're afraid to be with our own thoughts because that's where truths are revealed. That's when we are forced to confront things that we don't want to think about. It's almost schizophrenic in a way. You know, schizophrenia is the uh, detachment from the real world or from reality. And we all do that. That's what the false self tells us. That's what the masks tell us. But we look at our degrees. And I think really uh, of any degree in masonry, I don't think any degree uh, illustrates that better than the Royal Arch degree, frankly. It is that journey inward, step after step. It is that search for the lost word. And the lost word is the true self, that divinity within us. And that's the reason why I say, you know, if you listen to the true self, it'll never steer you wrong because that is that element of God within each and every one of us. We just have to quiet our minds. And so I talked to you about uh, meditation at the beginning. And so let's talk about that just a little bit. I'm not going to get too deep into it. Um, one thing that I like to do in a lodge that I used to be a member of, uh, one thing that we would do is start each meeting with uh, about a five-minute period, uh, three to five-minute period of just quiet contemplation. Often we would have a little uh, soft music in the background or maybe use a uh, Tibetan singing bowl, if anybody is familiar with these. But just to, to give a little resonance there, sound, but uh, really it was to center ourselves before we jumped into the lodge meeting. It was a time for us to purge ourselves of all those vices and superfluities, the minerals and metals, so to speak, that we should be leaving outside of the lodge room. We should be doing that ourselves on a daily basis. Take 10 minutes out of your day just to engage in thought. That's really all meditation is. If you're driving down the road, turn the radio off and just think. That is meditation. Some people like to sit in a quiet room and, and uh, burn a little incense, things of that nature. And that's all well and good. Uh, I've, I've done that a few times myself. I enjoy that. But my meditation is a cigar and, you know, and a glass of scotch. And I just think. Sometimes I'll even get a journal out and start jotting down some of my notes because I may realize something profound that I never thought about before. Kind of like when I was talking about the, uh, the gavel being used as an instrument of destruction. You better believe I had to journal that so I would not forget that. That's all meditation is. So don't, don't be afraid of meditation. I, I just think everyone, everyone should utilize that. You can read uh, Brother Chuck Dunning's book, Contemplative Masonry, where he really puts that into a, a practical approach. Uh, so I highly recommend that to, to anyone. But masonry does provide a path. It's not a religion, but it is very spiritual. When we realize that the true self, the lost word, is within us and has always been within us, then our lives really can change. Our relationships can change. The way we see other people, the world around us will change. And we all know people who are content just to go through life the way they are. Sometimes unfulfilled, unhappy, but they don't want to take any steps to improve their situation. They don't want to 
engage in contemplation or thought. They don't want to uh, enlighten themselves. The seven liberal arts and the fellow craft degree really point us in that direction. We are to uh, ever increase in knowledge. You know, read books, watch a documentary. Just learn as you go, because by experiencing these new ideas and even having conversations with other people who may have differing views, by doing that, we learn things about the world around us, and thereby we learn things about ourselves that maybe we haven't realized before. And I'll tell you that, you know, sometimes when you engage in that meditation and contemplation, you will realize things about yourself you've never noticed, you've never been aware of. Maybe other people see it, but the ego has prevented you from seeing it. And sometimes those things are not pretty. But it's only when you take that time to really think and engage that you connect with those elements of the true self. And you realize, you know, there's this aspect of me that I don't like. You know, I'm just a jerk. We all are. It's okay. That's human nature. But the road to enlightenment is understanding that we are human. We are going to make mistakes. But we can't fall into the trap of listening to the masks. We can't fall into the trap of letting our ego dictate to us what is right and our path that we should follow. We have to be in control of the ego. We have to tell the ego what to do. And so masonry, again, when you break down our degrees, it really does point us towards finding the lost word. Finding the divinity within ourselves. And see, when I give this presentation to uh, craft lodges, I really can't talk too much about the Royal Arch degree. Um, you know, for brothers who have not been through the Royal Arch degree, I don't think they'd really understand. But I think that is one of the deepest, most esoteric degrees I have ever seen. Bar none. That search for the lost word is our journey that we go through. I don't know how many of you here have heard of Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell wrote, uh, he wrote several books, but his most famous book was called Hero with a Thousand Faces. And what Campbell did, uh, in fact, uh, I've got a copy of it uh, right here, and you can see I've got it all marked in here. Um, what Campbell did was took hero legends from history, whether it be uh, the Greeks, Romans, wherever, compared all these cultural stories and realized that they're all pretty much the same story. They're all telling the same thing, whether you're reading uh, the Iliad, or a Superman comic. It's a story that's ingrained in us. And just to summarize what, what uh, Campbell wrote, think of, think of it like a, a clock. Your hero starts out at noon. He's an ordinary person in his ordinary world going about his ordinary life. And about one o'clock, he's called to a greater action, something bigger than himself, something that he needs to resolve. And he goes around that clock and he meets someone or maybe several people who aid him and provide uh, knowledge or the tools that he needs to accomplish his goal. And he goes around, then you get to six o'clock down at the bottom. Campbell refers to that as the abyss. 
That's where the hero is defeated. That's where Superman gets hit with kryptonite, right? Look at any superhero movie. That's the best way to look at that. Or, or Star Wars is a great example of that hero's journey. It looks like the hero is defeated. There's no way he's going to come back from that. But he does. He finds a way, and he's stronger because of that. So we move on around the clock, 9 o'clock. He confronts his enemy, confronts the villain, confronts whatever it is that is the challenge, and defeats it because he's become stronger because of what he's been through. Move up around to about 10 o'clock. The reward. He's rewarded for what he's accomplished. Then you move back around to 12 o'clock. Back to the ordinary world he came from. And the world around him, the world that he returned to, has not changed. But he has changed. He'll never be the same person. He'll never go back to who he was before. Think about that in the context of our degrees. Our degrees also symbolizing uh, birth, youth, middle age, death, and then rebirth. What happens in our third degree? It's that defeat, actually being slain within the rebirth, the renewal. When we are raised to the sublime degree of Master Masons, we're no longer the same person as we were when we first knocked at that door. We've just experienced that hero's journey that Campbell talked about. And that hero's journey, that reward that we, we see, that reward that we get after we vanquish our enemy, that's that glimpse of the true self. That's that inner sanctum sanctorum within ourselves. And that's what we should all strive to find. That's what we should be looking for. So think about that as you go through your day. Are the decisions you make made by the true self? Or is that the false self? Is that the mask that you're wearing speaking? Is that the ego trying to tell you what you should do and where you should go and whatever? Where is that coming from? As far as Masonically, in our degrees, whether it be uh, the Craft Lodge degrees or the York Rite degrees, uh, or especially the degrees of the chapter in the council, there are really deep, deep philosophical ideas there, but they're all pointing towards that, that search for the true self. It's all telling us that that material world around us is not the most important thing. Yes, we need to be concerned with it. We need to be concerned with our investments. We need to be concerned with our homes and families and jobs. I'm not saying to give up everything you have and, and go live in the wilderness as a hermit and eat crickets for the rest of your life. What I'm saying is don't let those things control you. Don't make the mistake of assuming that these things are who you are. We say that the lost word is ineffable. And I said that the lost word is that divinity within ourselves. I think the lost word is the true self. So I will say this. I don't think that it's ineffable. Ineffable means what? It means unknowable. I think we can get to know the true self. Now, can it be put into words? No. I could describe myself. I'm six foot, blonde hair, extremely handsome. That's fine. You know, I'm a homeowner. Uh, I'm an employee. Uh, all of these things I can describe elements myself. 
but can I ever put into words who I am, who the true self is? No. Any of you who have been to the house of the temple in DC have seen the Tyler's chair outside of the lodge room. What's engraved on the back of the Tyler's chair? It says, know thyself. In Hamlet, Shakespeare wrote, to thine own self be true. Same thing. When we hear the words, whence came you? Those words now take on a different meaning. It's saying, who are you? Who are you really? It's a journey. It really is. As master masons, uh, we need to, to realize that. We spend so much of our time in that inner apprentice realm. And we, we dip our toes into the fellow craft realm or uh, just glimpse at the master mason realm. But we're all really inner apprentice. We aspire to be fellow craft and master masons. And sometimes we hit it. But most of the time, we're not there. And so I'll just leave you with this. Engage in just 10 minutes of quiet thought every day. I don't care if it's just driving down the road, driving to your office or your, your, your work. I don't care if it's just, you know, sitting in a quiet room in your home. Just spend 10 minutes getting to know yourself. And you might be surprised who you think you are may not be exactly who you think you are. But I guarantee you this, you will like who you find out you are. You will like the true self. And once you're introduced to the true self, I guarantee you'll spend a lot more time talking to him. So I'll, I'll end it there. Uh, Brother Steve and I will turn it back over to you. And I'm happy to take any questions, comments, threats. <laughs>